Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now, the subject of our talk today is something which most of us in our lives have experienced, and that is good old-fashioned personnel, or rather, as it's known now, work, human resources. This is a department in, a f in most firms and charities and government departments, which has hugely grown uh, in recent years. And the effect of it has been extraordinary in many ways. Now, to discuss it, I'm very pleased we have the Daily Telegraph columnist, Juliet Samuel, uh, who recently wrote uh, a fantastic piece about the growth of HR. Um, it does seem a bit of a dry topic on the face of it. But I'd say to you, Julia, that this is one of the great unstudied areas at the moment in terms of the kind of political revolution we're going through, the cultural revolution. I mean, you know, first of all, what do you see? Why did you write about it? What is the problem, do you think? Well, so I suppose this started off with a phenomenon that is becoming increasingly familiar, which is that of so-called woke capital or woke incorporated, where you suddenly see big companies start to do strange things that you, you can't understand how it's in their interests, whether it's um, espousing some kind of radical, usually left-wing ideology, yeah. or, um, or announcing you know, a new working practice or a new uh, well-being initiative, something that seems slightly off from what you would think their purpose is. And so what I wanted to do was to look at organizationally how and why is this happening um, almost from a sociological point of view, yeah. because I think there's been a lot written about the effects of this or the, the instances we see, whether it's in university campuses or employment tribunals or, um, or you know, discourse. But what we haven't really looked at is organizationally, who is doing this and why are they doing it? And actually a lot of it in workplaces it's now come out of universities and it is in workplaces. A lot of it is coming from this department, the Human Resources Department. So that's what I wanted to look at. So I, what I would gather from that, and what you say in your piece, which I should say, by the way, was in the Telegraph a couple of weeks ago, yeah. uh, is that the power dynamic has changed entirely in, for example, your average company, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, what used to be a bit of a backwater personnel, it was a very technical thing, wasn't it? Payroll and all of that. It's now become this extraordinarily powerful department, hasn't it? Yeah, so there's been a transformation basically uh, since the early 90s, but it's massively accelerated in recent years, which is why it's become more, um, more present and urgent to look at it. But basically what happened is from the 80s or 90s, um, and this, this correlated with a period when, at least in the UK, but also in the US, you started to get much more employment legislation um, expanding into all areas of how you manage your staff. And with that came uh, a phenomenon that started in the universities, as a lot of this does, in business schools, where the personnel department, which processed paperwork, you know, admin, payroll, um, you know, sending letters in the right way, started to become transformed into a, a specialism uh, with you know, an academic discourse behind it. And there was this fellow, David Guest, who wrote a model of human resources management. Um, and the promise of this model was that if you can manage your staff better in this new modern way, then they'll be more productive and you'll make more money. Mm -hmm. And so it all started there. And, and it was actually interesting initially um, the, the sort of trade union movement that had been defeated in the 80s was quite suspicious of this new fangled thing called human resources because it was meant it was serving the corporate interest. Yeah. Um, but over time from there, we had this expansion in, you know, this academic field of people management and people the qualifications started to be offered, new models, and it, and it grew beyond this idea that, um, you know, we just have to deal with employment legislation and it became some kind of magic potion or a golden goose that, that would, you know, magically transform your company. And then um, over the last probably decade, particularly since the financial crisis in, in financial uh, companies, but also in the public sector, um, this question of company culture uh, came to the fore and the idea that you know, if you could uh, manage a bank in a manager bank's culture, 
then you could avoid things like you know the financial crisis that the financial crisis wasn't a question of low interest rates and misguided regulation and it was a question of toxic masculinity or, or mm. something mm. like that um and and instead of thinking well you know workplace culture is usually set by the managers and so if they're a good person and they manage things well then you know and they listen to people then usually things are okay. It started to become, no, no, this is a specialism. It needs to be regulated. It needs to be discussed. Um, there need to be guidelines and policies and handbooks. And so it grew into this, you know, bureaucratic, um, uh, sort of towering bureaucratic edifice. And then um, you had imported into that a lot of radical ideology, which maybe we'll, we'll come yeah, to. Yeah. What are we talking about in terms of numbers then? Say like, how you know how big is it now the area of hr compared to like 20 years ago so it used to be about um i think it was in 2004 it was about 0.9 percent of the workforce it's now 1.3 percent of the workforce so that is maybe a 30 40 percent growth in terms of you know the share of people whose time is wholly taken up with this but that doesn't fully capture it because you also have um the amount of time you have the power of of these people so for example the composition it used to be quite a a, a, a low paid job um, that wasn't particularly powerful but the number of managers and directors who are hr officials has, has massively risen that's now more than half so they're on the boards of companies yeah and now. so three FTSE 100 companies have um hr directors on their boards and 70% have them on their executive committees, which will be the, you know, the main day-to-day -day top committee that runs the company. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't even include, that's before you even get to the charitable and the public sector where, you know, the trends are harder to see, but they're probably, we can surmise, they're probably more, um, have accelerated faster. And so now you, you have the point, well, one thing that was interesting in writing the piece was that it was extremely difficult to get high-powered business people who've been in their industry for many years were scared to talk to me about this. They didn't. Well, I noticed that in your piece, it's like one insider who did not want to yes. be named, or yeah. wh whether people on the receiving end or people, as it were, deal, you know, dealing it out. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. That pe people don't want to be named because they're scared, and that goes to your previous question: Why are, why is the CEO of a major company scared of the personnel manager, mm. and? A large part of the reason for that is the ideology that has now entered companies via the HR department. Um, and a lot of that is very radical, progressive ideology, what you know some people call woke, um, uh, woke norms. Um, and what people are scared of, what managers are scared of, is, is being caught out, being caught on the wrong side of this movement, that which they know is very vicious, which they uh, feel to be very powerful, though you know is actually probably not as powerful as it as it presents itself, and um, they get told by you know their expert uh, HR manager. Well, look now, what's happened is that everyone's talking about diversity, and, and one of the things that really kickstarted this was the murder of George Floyd and the the, the Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S., which sort of in a tsunami swept across. Um, the, the 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 democratic world and you know suddenly everyone was talking about it and a lot of hr departments said oh my god we've had all these diversity schemes for many years but now we're being told it's not enough and they themselves a lot of them were worried and scared and they thought well we need to hire someone we need to do something and so they would say to their executives well um you're going to be asked about this you've got to say this you've got to do this or we're, we're going to hire someone um, you know, without really scrutinizing who this mm. person is, mm. what their ad ideas are and where they come from more broadly and in political sense. Mm. We're just going to hire someone to fix this problem and they're going to tell us we have to hold a seminar on race or we have to start using name badges with people's pronouns on um, because it doesn't, it doesn't just stop in one area, it expands into all sorts of other areas. Um, and so suddenly you're extrapolating from, from duties that seemed or, or laws that seemed quite run of the mill into all sorts of radical areas where you're suddenly telling your employees that they can't post things on social media that you know in their political views or, or, or there have been some cases of that haven't there yeah. people saying things you know i think someone was uh on facebook talked about refugees i think there was some, yeah but um there's one so you actually quote somebody who, anonymously who uh who talked who's an academic who simply 
was sort of seen on some Brexit demonstrations, got in a bit of a, not a verbal fight mm. with someone. Yeah. Um, but then this person was then seen or called to the HR department. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what happened was this was a, an academic at a Russell Group University, a top university in the UK, who um, all he did, he supported Brexit and he went to a Brexit rally. Um, to support it and then he got into a bit of an altercation where he was you know it maybe was a bit unedifying he was swearing at some yeah. remainers and um, you know sort of uh, uh, being quite um, uh, sort of forthright in his views and expressing them in maybe a crude yeah. way and but he didn't have any any there was nothing that said he was from the university it was nothing to do with his workplace he was a private citizen you know, uh, um, uh, in, in engaging in his right to political protest and to political expression. But this was found on social media. Someone identified who his employer was. And immediately, um, the HR department was flooded with complaints. They said, we, we've got to do something. This is, this is appalling. Um, and, you know, he was hauled immediately into a, into a process that would eventually lead to them firing him. Um, he did ma then manage to appeal and won his appeal because uh, at some point they realized legally, actually, you can't just fire someone for their political views, even if they express them in, in, in a way you don't approve of. Um, but he was, he, it went through months where he could feel his job being prized from his hands. And he was, you know, his PhD students were pressured to move to other supervisors. He was suspended from teaching. He kept being called to hearings and then weeks would pass and he didn't know what was going on. And so, and he's just one of, of you yeah. know, many cases. And these are just the cases that hit tribunals or that we hear about, where HR departments are often finding themselves on the wrong side of the law in their enthusiasm to, um, to, to import this ideology or to, and they don't, a lot of them don't realize what they're doing is extremely political and extremely mm -hmm. controversial. They think that all they're doing is implementing the company handbook. Or some of them even think that they're making the world a better place and yeah, that they're crusaders yeah. for a moral force. Yeah. But actually what they're doing is suppressing, um, you know, rights of employees that go back, you know, decades and sometimes centuries and, uh, and, and overbearing and, and stamping out dissents. It's, uh, there was also the case of um, Maya Forstata, wasn't there? The, yeah. um, and uh, that was, I think she just simply said there's such a thing as biological sex in her view. And uh, she was dismissed, but I think she won her case, didn't yes, she? Yes, she did. And that's, that's one of the, the interesting things about this is HR departments are meant to be there to stop workplaces and employers getting into trouble with the law. Um, but in fact, what they're doing in many cases is, is forgetting that they need to obey the law themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, uh, and um, Mayor Forstater was one case where uh, she, you know, they tried to fire her for, they did fire her for saying that she didn't believe that you could become a woman or become a man. Um, but there was another case of a, um, uh, that I mentioned in the piece of a, of a, an, a Lloyd's employee who um, wrote something against refugees in Calais on her, on her Twitter, I think it was, and then, um, you know, found herself in a disciplinary process. And in the end, you know, the law was on her side. Mm -hmm. Um, so they've strayed so far from what their function is, which is meant to be to protect the company, um, into almost inadvertently becoming, mm. uh, you know, social justice warriors in a radical movement. Why, why don't sort of like the chief executives or the chairman, why, why don't they sort of say, steady on? You know, why don't they stop it? Well, I think there's a, there's a mix of answers <laughs> to that. The, the, the most positive answer is that in some workplaces they do. And I did speak to one chief executive of a big company who said, look, um, you know, we've we've taken this and we have implemented some diversity stuff. You know, we've started celebrating Eid in the workplace. We have a lot of Muslim employees as well as Christmas. And actually, that's been quite positive. But, you know, um, and that person saw a, a, their HR department creating a presentation about white privilege. And they and they said, no, we're not going to do that because we're not we don't want to create hate groups in this company we're going to do positive things that try to improve relations. Um, but for the most part, most uh, managers, they, they don't have the time, they don't have the inclination or the interest to, to delve into this very controversial political field of whether it's pronouns or, um, or race relations. 
Um, and so, you know, they're suddenly told they have to do something because um, suddenly they've been, social trends have swept through, you know, all these channels, um, some of them legal channels, some of them, uh, you know, academic channels have swept through into human resources departments and, and suddenly they're told you have to do this because otherwise um, you could be fired or the board, the, our investors might want to know why you're not doing it or um, there might be a Twitter storm and we'll have to suspend you. Um, and, and, you know, these threats aren't usually issued explicitly, but people can see what's going on. They see witch hunts on social media. They see um, investors, you know, some of these large institutional investors putting out statements saying, we want all our companies to tell us why, you know, they don't have this amount of representation. We want to set them targets on this. And, they, and people feel, um, some of them, that they, they have to do something. Now, there's, there's a third category who are, the, who are the, the executives or the managers who fully embrace it, who go all but guns blazing and, you know, sometimes other trailblazers for this stuff. Um, people like Lord Brown, mm. who, um, you know, and there's, and there's a lot of interesting sort of psychological questions as to why someone would do that. You know, are they trying to um, purge themselves of a career that's out of fashion or are they trying to... Um, you know, is it a power, you know, one of the, the major uh, drivers of this is probably a sort of power mania. You know, they've suddenly found a way where they can be on platforms and people yeah. can um, can praise them and people, and it's almost the sort of political high that they get where they they think, well, this is my thing now. Maybe I'm no, I'm no longer the head of BP or, the, or some major company, but people will still listen to me and I can still be relevant and powerful. Yes. I mean, we're in the middle of, is it Pride Month now? Um, and in London, at least, the place is bedecked in the, uh, it's called now Progressive Pride flag, all over. <clears throat> um, would that sort of thing have originated, for example, in HR departments? I mean, if you go along and you see it at the bank or you see it at God knows where, Smith's or wherever it might be, Waitrose, mm. would that be an initiative that would come from that area? It, it probably would, but there's actually, HR is actually, what's one of the things that's interesting about it is that it's actually a conduit now for other other forces and there are two main forces in this sort of area that you're talking about and one is charity the charitable sector so groups like stonewall um for whom frankly a lot of this is a money-making yeah. scheme so we have this you have the stonewall diversity champion scheme i think it is where yeah. effectively companies um pay stonewall as a charity to assess them and to certify them as you know you are this good a gold medal or a you know, or a bronze yeah. medal yeah, yeah, at, yeah. at being friendly to um, to, to gay employees. Um, and so the HR department, you know, will often say, how do we deal with this, with this problem? We're going to hire a charity to do it. And if they tell us what we have to do and we do it, then, then, then we've done it. Um, and so, you know, if you have a, a, a charity like Stonewall that's become increasingly radical and moved into a, you know, a very new ideology, um, on, uh, on, on gender and sex, um, then that can seamlessly suddenly feed yes, through into yes, a company. Yes. And then the other um, force is, is these employee network groups. So you may have seen them, you know, if you're in a workplace, you've probably started to notice some of these networks pop yeah. up and it will be the, um, uh, some of them are quite, you know, the, the, the parents network or, uh, or, or there'll be the, the black and minority ethnic uh, employees network or um, the LGBT plus network. So like people basically collected together under one character. Yeah, yeah. So and, and some of this, you know, um, is pretty uh, uh, u ubiquitous, or, you know, pretty uncontroversial. It's, you know, oh, we're um, we all have this issue. Let's gather together every so often to talk about, you know, what it's like um, being a parent or being gay in the workplace. But what's happened over the last couple of years is that uh, some of these groups um, have become much more powerful, have become much more radical. Um, and, and some of that is because HR departments, again, they're wanting to sort of look busy and they're saying, what do we do on race? Well, here we have, um, we have a, a, a network of black employees. Let's outsource that to them and they can tell us what to do. And these aren't elected, you know, these are self-appointed people, the people who have the most time or the most interest in this particular issue. Um, and suddenly are, are dictating company policy on things. And, and people are scared because then once, they, once they've 
set that arrangement up. If they then want to dispute anything, then the network, you know, the employee network can say, well, look, you, you're not committed to this or you're racist or I feel threatened or I feel unsafe. Um, and suddenly they, they start to have a, a problem and, the, you know, the power shifts and people, yes. are, people are scared. Yeah. So, so, so that kind of thing, you know, may well have come from an employee network may well have come from, you know, a charity yeah. consultant effectively, um, goes through the company, you know, infrastructure and without challenge, and suddenly they're putting this this new flag on petrol stations, on, mm. you know, hanging them up in the street, and without really knowing what they mean or what they've gotten into. Do you know, I think as well, Julia, a lot of people are uh, hazy as to their legal rights and position mm -hmm. in this situation. I mean, Pretty much every company. I mean, the point is with with the as your article says, and with HR generally, we are talking private companies, public sector companies, charities, almost every organisation now. Yeah. Um, and they've been suffused, I would say, with critical race theory, and as you say, with gender ideology. Um, people do not know what they can and cannot do. So, for example, unconscious bias training is <clears throat> is a well known one. Do people have to go on it? Do you know? I mean, I think people. Um, I think people do have to. If their company rolls out a training program, um, I think they do have to go on it. I don't think they have to. If if their company then um, there was a case actually that I looked at. I can't remember if I mentioned it in the piece where um, an uh, it was an IT consultant. She um, she was made to do unconscious bias training. She did it, and but then. At the end, there was, a, there was a questionnaire where you had to fill in, are you biased now? And I think you had to, you had to answer no, because you'd done the training. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that yeah. had expunged <laughs> you of your sins and, and purified yeah. you. Um, and, so, and she said, well, I, 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 I feel this is a lie because, you know, um, maybe I am biased. I don't want to fill in this questionnaire. I feel it's a sort of, you know, like she's made, being made to take an oath or, yes, or almost yes. a religious ritual. Also, the whole implication is that you were before. Yeah, exactly. Even you might yeah. feel you weren't. Yeah, and yeah. now you've sort of mm. been confessed your sins or whatever it is. Anyway, so she, she said, I'm not going to do this, and she won that case. Oh. So, so there are, um, it's, it's, a, it's a murky area, and some of these norms are now being set through tribunals, but if people aren't sure what they should do is um, is get advice from a union. Now, what they should not do is go to the traditional unions um, who are members of the Trade Union Congress, right. because actually they too have been overtaken by the same thing. And they're just as much as anyone else promoting, you know, gender theory or, um, or, or critical race theory. But there are smaller unions who are now expanding to fill this gap and um, there's the workers of england union there's a union called affinity and there's the free speech union which i have a role on, on yeah. the advisory board of um uh, an unpaid role i should say right. but um uh, but there are there's basically advice out there for people who yeah. aren't sure what they can do i mean do you know i i we talk an awful lot on this program about the march through the institutions etc you know so names like uh, rudy deutsche and um, deutsche Ka, sorry and obviously Gramsci uh, are well known to us. I mean, I'm sort of setting you up there for, for that question, but when, or should, should I say, why did this happen? I mean, you know, when you look at it, you sort of think, well, we can pretty much see in public sector or whatever, why, you know, it's always been slightly more political. But when it comes to the, the fact that now across the board, um, they're all singing from the same hymn sheet. Mm. It's hard not to see, isn't it, that it's sort of almost like a concerted attempt at social engineering. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you agree with that? Do you think that, do you think, is it reflected in the people that actually go for these jobs? Yeah, I think it's partly that. I think that, I don't think that there's some conspiracy that, you know, there's a, there's a Marxist vanguard here that has thought this is how we'll spread our ideology and, you know, it's bloody win, effective though, win isn't over it? the superstructure or whatever. Yeah. But, um, yeah, well, it is very, this is sort of effectively what's happened, but I don't think there's, you know, there's a conspiracy. I do think that um, there has been a successful movement um, that started in universities that said, uh, you know, a lot of these ideas started in very small, unpopular departments in universities. Um, and then, you know, has, has effectively expanded, um, you know, people who've been through 
that education have now graduated into the workforce. Um, some of them have, uh, you know, a, a notion of what they're there for, what their life is for, what their career is for. Um, at the same time, you have a sort of, uh, um, so there's, there's demand for these jobs. At the same time, you have an industry creating these sorts of jobs yeah. where you can go into a, a workplace and often not do some, anything that's very productive. Um, uh, that's also, you know, some of these uh, degrees in these jobs have lower entry requirements. They're quite a steady route into a steady job, a steady career. Um, you know, and a lot of the people have not thought hugely deeply about a lot of the ideology that's then coming through. Um, and you, and then you also combine with that have norms on the other side coming from sort of business academia that have created openings, which aren't, which, which weren't ideological, um, particularly, which often started off as a, as a commercial or a management tool. And one of those, for example, is the concept of psychological safety. Yeah. Um, uh, and there was a professor, Amy Edmondson, who, who coined this phrase in a business context. And the way that she meant it was, um, you should make sure your staff have psychological safety because what that means is they can say something a bit outlandish or they can point out a bad working practice, be a bit of a whistleblower or take a risk with an idea and they're not going to get, you know, immediately um, a pile on. Um, but, but that in itself is, a, is an example of conceptual drift where you've taken safety, which, you know, we all understood to mean physical safety yeah. back in the day. Um, you know, and, and, and you've added psychological to it. So then it's, so then it's about your mind. Um, and then you add ideology into it where you say, uh, you add microaggressions, yeah. for example, where um, uh, someone might be insulting me or I think that, um, or I know, or I have a strong instinct that, that what that person did is to do with my race, you know, which may be correct in some instances, may in, in others not be correct, but uh, you add that in and suddenly, your notion of safety has become, well, I don't think anyone should be allowed to roll their eyes at me um, in the workplace. Or, you know, if someone refers to, um, you know, the, some history, like we, our grandparents fought in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the Second World War for freedom, you know, that's a microaggression because actually my grandparents came from a totally different mm -hmm. background. And suddenly you're, you're in a kind of ratchet where, um, where the, the radical ideology has combined with often fairly benign or, you know, uh, um, unsurprising uh, kind of jargon, basically, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. almost like taking something that's really quite straightforward, like people should be able to say dumb or controversial things in the workplace, take a risk, adding jargon to it and then adding ideology. And this is what you and get. And it, it turns out to be the exact opposite, doesn't it? I mm -hmm. mean, in the sense of yeah. now I would have thought the workplace is an unsafe yeah, place for most right, people because right. I mean you don't know what you yeah. can say so it must make it an incredibly hard thing to face you know mm. for many people every day um okay so obviously maybe not a conspiracy but obviously extremely powerful now um and you and th there's also a class element to this of course which is that th this is a very sort of middle to upper class well, um, yes. set of norms it's very female isn't it so it's like three quarters women isn't yes. that right working yeah. in um i don't know you know what what that particularly it means tend, tend to be i think um more middle middle class women um there's often you know in some workplaces you'll have a dynamic where you know HR, it, it's HR versus the more working class professions, whether it's firefighters or factory workers yeah. or, you know, and, and there's a set of norms and language. You know, there's always been class um, signaling through language as to yeah. whether you belong or whether you don't. Yeah. And this is another way of doing that, another way of policing people's speech. But it's, it's kind of interesting that this is, this is from the left because in yeah. theory the left is meant to be, you know, in favor of the proletariat and the and the bottom up, but you know, it's kind of um, through through the maelstrom of culture has inverted itself in many cases. Yes, and also the, there are these whole other notions that come into Asia now, which are connected mm. to this, like general well-being, you yes, know, um, or mindfulness, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And you know, apart whatever you think about those concepts, I mean, I don't have much time for them, <coughs> but essentially they're entirely subjective, aren't they? Yeah. And I mean, you know, what exactly does this mean? You know, and whose business is it, you know, uh, of, of these people to actually 
enforce it right. or try to. Well, again, this is something that has moved from the realm of, of, of common sense discussion into this sort of jargonized you know, um, realm of concepts. So you could take the common sense case. You know, If someone goes off work with stress or they have a mental breakdown or they have caring responsibilities or they have a baby, you know, um, you know, it, it used to be back in the day that work, workplaces weren't very sympathetic to that. It was sink or swim on your own. And, you know, one of the, the good trends that has come out of some of this is now more workplaces say, well, actually, we we recognize that, you know, if we wait a bit or we support you or you we offer you some flexibility, often people can come back and, you know, and then be productive or, um, you know, get their life back on track. But what are that it, it, we've morphed from that into um, into this this thing well-being, um, which which was massively uh, accelerated by COVID and the whole working from home thing, um, which has now become a huge battleground because most managers, frankly, want their employees back in, um, but they can't get them back in. And the human resources departments who's meant to be managing this are the are the last people who are still at home, and so they they have they no really leg like to stand being, on. Yeah, yeah they sorry. have no leg to stand on in bringing mm. people back. Um, but it's morphed now into, you know, through the idea of psychological safety and all these other concepts that we have to, people need to be able to bring their whole selves to work. This is a, a, something a Bank of England um, uh, manager said that um, the notion that if you're not allowed to talk endlessly about your problems at work, for example, that that's an affront to your mental well being and your safety. Or the notion that um, if you, can't work from home or you you know most days of the week or you can't uh, go off and 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 take a, a yoga break or whatever that your the company is not caring for you um, you know companies are now expected not just to pay you well um, and you know make sure that your rights are respected but they're meant to look after you like a parent yes. almost, you know and to and to to coddle you and you know this Jonathan Haidt has written about this concept that you know we have a, a generation of people who haven't fully grown up because they haven't been allowed to take risks on their own and they expect organizations to be their parent more than to, to it to be a, a transaction you know a relationship of, of sort of um, you know work for pay or, or you know involving loyalty but essentially not one where that involves um, that kind of care so there's a c category confusion there. I think uh, recently obviously you you know, uh, Elon Musk right, said basically to his employees, you know, you've got to come back. Yeah. And I think he specifically mentioned human <clears throat> uh, resources, you know, because they tend to yeah. like to be at home. But he said, you know, this is one thing you cannot do from home. Yeah. Um, do you think, finally, do you think that it would be a good thing for companies if they actually just, you know what, let's take the whole thing down to like three or four people again. Mm -hmm you know, and just dismantle this? Yeah, I think I think the truth is basically managers have to take this in hand. They cannot just let this dynamo yeah. um, do its own thing anymore. And, you know, it's, it, it involves some effort and some dealing with stuff that, frankly, most of them view as a waste of time, which is to say, what do we actually want from our workforce? What should their, the norms be, the, their rights, their holiday or whatever? Um, pair it down to that. Where are we actually, what do we actually do that affects retention? Let's do that. Um, and let's get rid of all the other yeah. crap. And let's, you know, not worry about what they're going to say about us on Twitter. And, you know, make sure that base is covered. Make sure you do it in a way that's not going to unnecessarily sort of knock the wasps, wasp's nest and set off something. Defend yourself. But say, you know, we need to sit down with these people and say, do you realize what your job is? Because what you're doing isn't it. Um, and so, you know, and in a way, I think it could be quite a simple thing to solve because actually the law and the powers are often still with the managers, you know, if they're prepared to put in the time and the effort and frankly, you know, have the guts to do it, yeah. then there's a way to do it. Well, uh, guts, I think that's the main uh, thing. That, that's one of the things that seems to be uh, missing uh, at the moment. Um, thanks so much. You know, I know that people are going to be very interested in this. I know I am. Um, thank you for coming and explaining it to us. Um, that is it for this week. You can read Juliet Samuel in the Telegraph every week. Yes, every Saturday. And the piece is called uh, uh, the HR, How the HR Monster Throttled the Workplace. So there you go. 
Perfect. you look it up online on the Telegraph <laughs> website. <laughs> Thanks so much, Julia. So see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.